So from a really young age, we learn that jealousy is not necessarily the best thing, that it's harmful to our relationships with other people and that it's detrimental to ourselves. And so we know that when it comes up, as it does from time to time, we need to push back against that. We need to be really careful when that happens. Um, but inevitably, because we are people who do life with other people, jealousy is something that arises. And I know I find myself getting jealous when I'm around my friends and my colleagues who have the gift of music. All of you who can sing, I find myself jealous of you because I really, ooh, I really cannot sing very well. And that's something that it makes me sad, but it also makes me sorry to anybody who's ever had to stand next to me during a time of singing together. But really, whether or not I or you consider yourself somebody who can sing, the fact of the matter is that song is a part of all of our lives in multiple ways. I mean, on the grandest level, it's the thing that we transmit our culture and our traditions with from one generation to the next. I mean, song and music bring many of us happiness. It's a source of beauty and it's a source of connection to other folks and other cultures and so many other things in our world. Song is a real gift and it's also a powerful thing. It's really integral to the way that we learn. I mean, I'm pretty sure most of us in here learned our alphabet through a song, and really most of our early learning about language and about life comes in the form of song, because in song, we're able to see patterns and connect thoughts to one another, and songs really help things like stick into our minds. And that's something that marketers know really well. I mean, how many stupid little commercial jingles do you get stuck in your head whether or not you intentionally remember those little jingles or not? And it's not just marketers, though, that know the power of song. It's also the church. I mean, think about if you go into almost any church anywhere, you'll find folks singing and that's not just the case now or like in the last decade, but that has been the case since the beginning of the church's existence. Song has been a part of the way that we as followers of Jesus have learned and have lived our faith. And now we have historical proof. I'm not just saying that, that the church has been singing for as long as it's existed, but in Paul's letter to the Colossians, which we're diving in, in that letter, Paul includes a worship song, a hymn, into that letter, which we're going to dive into in just a minute together. But just to reground ourselves in that letter to the Colossians, as I've already mentioned, uh, it's one of Paul's letters, like many that fills the pages of our New Testament. But the interesting thing about the Colossian letter is that Paul, this early church leader and church teacher and church planter, was writing to these folks in a town called Colossa, but he had never been there. He had never met those folks. He didn't know intimately who they were. But because he was eager, because he was mission-minded, he cared about them and what they were doing. And so he wanted to care for them as they faced the challenges of being community together, as they encountered the joys of doing life for and with Jesus. But maybe most important, what he really wanted to do and what most of the letter to the Colossians is about is he wanted to encourage them encourage them as they figured out what it meant to grow in their relationship with Jesus. And so it was in the body of this letter that he included the words of a song, a song that they were likely familiar with, a song that they might have sung together. And I think I feel really comfortable saying that because he knew the power of song to help them know and to remember and to live out the words of that song. And since it's so important, I thought it's a good time to read this together this morning. And you'll find it in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. And so we're going to read that this morning. You can follow along in your Bibles, or you can read along on the screen with me. And the words of this song, this hymn of our church, goes like this. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. 
For through him God created everything in heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning supreme over all who rise from the dead, so he is first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. So if you've had an opportunity to read the book of Colossians, which isn't super long, by the way, you might notice something, which is that what we just read, in some sense, is like the focus statement or the main point, if you will, of the rest of the letter. That the themes in these five verses that we just read are woven throughout the rest of of the book. I mean, basically everything that Paul says from his introduction about who he is to his hopes for this Colossian church to his explanation of what it means to be in proper relationship with one another to his sort of farewell and his closing words all point back in some sense to these five verses. These words are crucial. They have bearing on the whole letter and therefore Paul knew that these words had bearing on the lives of the whole lives of these Colossian folks. And so these words are important. And so I guess it's a case that we need to pay attention to these words. And I think that when we read them together and we pay attention to how this is all phrased, I think we see something pretty clearly and easily which is a certain repetition. And Chad has reminded us many times over the weeks that when we see repetition in Scripture, it's a really good idea for us to pay attention. And so what we have to pay attention here is the two phrases, really two words that mean the same thing, which is the words all, A-L-L, and everything. And so I feel comfortable saying that what the scripture and its repetition of those words, they repeat nine times. What the scripture is saying to us is that Christ has something to do with all the things. Now I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure if I started saying this phrase before this meme swept the internet a few years ago or afterwards, but... I know that if you hang out with me long enough, you'll hear me use this phrase pretty often. I mean, it really has so many variations, like do all of the things, clean all of the things, bake all of the things. And in some sense, it's a really good descriptor. Like, isn't the best description of a traffic jam, like all of the cars? Or study, or finals, all of the studying, or maybe more appropriate, all of the coffee? I don't know. But I do think what we get here is a description of Christ's work, which is that Christ does all of the things. Okay, maybe a little bit more accurately and articulately, really what the scripture is telling to us and its repetition and in the way that it is directing us is, it has three things to say to us, I think. Which is the first is that everything was and is created through Christ. Now, this is a huge idea. The idea is that before creation itself existed, before anything was, Christ was. And it was through him that God created creation itself. So that's a huge idea. But I think if we sort of narrow down the funnel a little bit, what we'll see is that everything has its beginning in Christ. Nothing would, nothing does exist without him. Everything is created through Christ. Then we have the notion that everything is held together through Christ. Not only is Christ creator, but he is sustainer. That everything is and everything is held together through him without his activity in our world, it would all fall apart. A scholar said it this way, I thought it was just right on point. He said, Christ is the glue of our universe. Everything is held together through Christ. 
And then third, everything finds its place in Christ. And I could say a lot about this, but our scripture says it best. In the message version, I'm always going to put up this quote as I read it. It says, everything of God finds its proper place in Christ without crowding. Not only that, but all the broken and all the dislocated pieces of the universe, people and things, animals and atoms, get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies because of him. Everything finds its place in Christ. And so I think when we see this, when we hear this description, what we begin to understand is simply how all-encompassing the work of Jesus Christ is in our world. The idea that rises to the surface is that Christ has bearing on and is the basis for all that there is. That Jesus Christ has bearing on and is the basis for all that there is. Now, you may be wondering now, after I've said all of these things, what this exactly has to do with our own growth and maturity in our lives of faith. What this statement about who Jesus is and what Jesus does has anything to do with us moving towards leveling up in our faith. And honestly, as I've been working with this text for a good while now, I was asking myself those questions. But then I found myself directed back to this main statement, this idea that Christ has bearing on and is the basis for all things, and remembered that Paul included this idea in his letter intentionally because he wanted these folks not only to know these words and to remember them, but also to live them out. And so that's our task too, to live out these words, to live out this truth in our life. And I think that begins with this text for us, with the recognition, with the paying attention to, once again, of the presence of that word, all, A-L-L. And I know I was just joking about my overusage of the phrase, all of the things, and it is pretty ridiculous, but all is serious business. I think all is serious business because we don't often think in these terms, that as adults especially, we don't always do a whole lot of holistic thinking. Instead, we have this tendency, maybe this sort of innate sense that what we are to do in life is to separate things, to pull things apart from one another, to compartmentalize our lives. And don't, I don't want you to hear me saying that's a bad thing. I think it's simply how our rational minds work. I think it allows us to focus and to be organized and honestly to communicate amongst ourselves. But I also do think that that habit or that tendency can be a little bit problematic when it creeps into our lives of faith. That as we go about our separating and our compartmentalizing, what we can do is something like this, is that we can take parts of our lives and give those parts intentionally over to God and let Jesus have the bearing that he has over them to follow him faithfully in those ways and in those things. And that is indeed a celebration. That is what all of this is about. But because we've done that work of separation, because we've done that compartmentalizing, we also can and knowing that I've done this myself, say we also do, intentionally take parts of our lives and draw them close into ourselves, thinking that we are the ones that ultimately have bearing over them. Now, this, this behavior can make itself manifest in so many ways. I'm not even going to try and list it. But one author I was reading said it well, I think, that it most often comes in the form of over-self-reliance. And so I think that's what Paul is talking about today when he's talking about the power of this reality of Christ's all-encompassing work. He tells us that while we as children of God have the capacity and the privilege of participating in what it is that Christ is doing in our world It's Christ and Christ alone that is creator. It's he and not us 
that fits all the broken and all the messy pieces of our lives back into place, that it's he who sustains us today, tomorrow, and forever. It's that truth, it is that all, is where the recognition of that and the confidence in that, I think, is where our growth begins and continues. Being aware and confident that all, all means 100%, every piece, every part of our lives is touched, is covered over, and is affected by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I think that's part of what Paul has for us this morning. I think the other part of it is seemingly kind of simple, but also important as we think about what it means to level up. And that is knowing when we need a reminder of this all. I mean, Paul, as I've said several times, included these words because he wanted the Colossians to know and to remember its contents of this song. He wanted them to remember because it was so crucial to their life of faith. But he also wanted them to remember because he realized they were starting to forget. And now I'm not just making this up for the sake of making this sermon flow well, but if you go down in chapter one, just below what we read this morning, you'll find Paul's phrasing, this is my paraphrase, goes something like this, y'all, you don't just walk away from a gift like this, this that you've been given in Jesus Christ. Instead, stay grounded and steady, always tuned in to that truth, not to be distracted or diverted. They were getting distracted and diverted. I think it's fair to say we get distracted and diverted often because the world, the world is a noisy place that pulls us in many directions. There's so many things that appeal to our wants and our needs and our desires. There's so many versions of what the good life looks like, what it is that we think we're supposed to be striving after, how it is that we think that we need to be growing in order to be successful or whatever it is. We get distracted and diverted Not only do we get distracted and diverted, but our attention spans are really short. I looked up this week, the average attention span of an American adult is eight seconds. That means we can only pay attention, listen, and absorb information for eight seconds at a time. Then we have to start the whole thing over. That is mind-boggling to me and probably another sermon in and of itself. But I also think it's the case that our attention spans are short when it comes to our lives of faith. I mean, our faith life not, don't always seem to be the most exciting or the most engaging or the most compelling thing that we have going on at one time or another. You know, we get distracted and diverted. So I think maybe, though, part of our growth, part of our maturity comes from knowing simply who we are, owning it, that we are people <laughs> with short attention spans who get distracted and diverted And then maybe the next step is knowing when we need a reminder, a reminder of the truth and the power of this all, a reminder just like the one that we have in Paul's words to us, that Christ is the one who creates and sustains and fits everything into place in our chaotic but beautiful world. I think part of our maturity comes from knowing when we need the reminder that we find in the Gospel of John that we talk about here often at Foundry, that not only is Christ creator, but he's one who took the risk of showing up amongst his creation, of putting on flesh and blood and of dwelling amongst us and of experiencing everything that we experience as human beings, a powerful reminder that I think, I hope, gives us comfort, but also ushers us a challenge regularly. I think part of our maturity, our leveling up, comes from knowing when we need a reminder, a reminder that we have in the gift of communion. The reminder that on the night when Jesus gave himself up for us on the cross, that he gave himself to us in another way, through a simple meal of bread and of wine, 
so that any time that we come together and we eat this simple meal, that we can encounter him, regardless of who we are, where we have been, what we have done, what we have left undone. Christ has given himself all of his love and all of his grace made available to us through this meal. A reminder that he indeed has bearing on and is the basis for everything there is, all of it, 100%.